So within the AQA AS chemistry specification, there are three um, reaction mechanisms that need to be known and drawn out. The first is nucleophilic substitution, and this is the second, elimination. Um, as the name suggests, something within this reaction mechanism, something is going to be eliminated from our starting molecule, ejected, removed, whatever you want, but it's going to be taken away. Now, what it ends up being is that we start with haloalkanes, and we end with alkenes. And ejected from this, or eliminated, is a halogen. So we start with a haloalkane, we eliminate a halogen, and we end up with an alkene. So not an alkane, an alkene. And this here then, this is where the name, the elimination, comes from. The problem with this is that there are quite a few similarities to nucleophilic substitution. The first being that haloalkanes are the starting product. Um, and the second being that the elimination reactions occur due to the hydroxide ions, which is, again is what can be used in nucleophilic substitution reactions. But obviously you can use other things, but hydroxide ion can be used and is quite often used in an exam situation. The main difference though is that the hydroxide ion, whereas in nucleophilic substitution it is acting as a nucleophile, here it's acting as a base, so as a proton acceptor, that being the definition, or one of the definitions of a base, a proton acceptor, a proton ultimately being a hydrogen ion. So this is going to accept a hydrogen ion, and as we can probably see here, we're going to produce water. So our hydroxide ion is going to accept a hydrogen ion, a proton, and we're going to make water ultimately. Before we actually get into the mechanism and what it looks like, it's important that you can understand really that there are differences in that at this point you might be saying well why if I can use hydroxide ions for elimination reactions and I can use them for nucleophilic substitution reactions how can that be why can they be involved in in, in both of them well conditions um, dictate really whether we would have an elimination reaction taking place or a nucleophilic substitution so in order to favor the elimination what we can do, a couple of simple things, we can use a higher temperature and the other one is that we can use ethanol as our solvent and what I mean by that is that if you imagine sodium hydroxide and we think about an, an ordinary situation we would say it's aqueous. And all that means is that our sodium hydroxide has been dissolved in water. Now in this case, we're not going to do that. We're going to take our sodium hydroxide and we are going to dissolve it in ethanol. So an absence of water. And what we end up finding is that this favours elimination reactions. And so you may see in the exam uh, potassium hydroxide in ethanol Blah, 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 within the question and that's a giveaway that we're going to be dealing with elimination as well as obviously the production of the alkene which is sometimes given um, in a reaction within the question. Okay so now what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at the mechanism itself. Okay so I've got my starting molecule here, my haloalkane, my 1-bromopropane um, and just as with any mechanism we're going to get some curly arrows involved and it's going to work, it's going to look exactly like this. So we have our hydroxide ion Remember, we're dealing mechanisms now, we have to draw our lone pair of electrons. Curly arrow coming in, it attacked the hydrogen there, and I'll explain a bit more about this in a second. The next step is that this, the electrons in this bond here move down onto here. Our final step being the electrons between the carbon and the halogen move onto the halogen itself. So we have this cascading effect, hydrogen onto there, and then moving onto there. This will always look similar to this in an elimination reaction, but obviously the starting molecule can differ, and that's where it comes in this whole idea of application. And they can also draw a link into isomerism as well, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but in terms of an application, it doesn't matter what molecule you start with, you always follow these same steps. And the steps are that the hydroxide ion, it always attacks the hydrogen attached to the carbon that is adjacent to the carbon attached to the halogen. 
So the hydroxide ion attacks the hydrogen attached to the carbon that is adjacent to the carbon attached to the halogen. So if it comes to an exam situation, draw yourself a nice little little thing like this. You know, there we go, there's my shape and I know that I'm going to attack there and I'm going to follow that shape through and that's always going to be the same. It needn't be this way around, it could be that way around. It's exactly the same and I'll look at that in a second as I said about isomerism. Um, but it's always going to follow that sort of shape there, this kind of weird lightning bolt thing. And again, cascade effect. And as I said at the start, it's acting as a base. It's accepted this proton here, this hydrogen ion, because the electrons have moved on here, so it's left as a hydrogen ion, it accepts them, we produce water here. So our product, one of our products is going to be water, and obviously we're going to have our halogen ejected, which ultimately is going to join up with the ion that was coupling with this. So potassium or, hydro, um, or sodium would end up with potassium bromide or sodium bromide. And actually I'll write out, in this case, I'll write out the equation for what would, what would occur. So if you imagine that this is, we can't just have hydroxide ions on their own, obviously. We have to have them coupled with something. So let's uh, go with um, CH3, CH2, CH2, Br, add, we'll go sodium hydroxide here, giving us the CH3, CH, CH2, add water, add sodium bromide. So what you can see here, this bit here, and you, you can also see it drawn um, in different ways. You might also see CH3, CH, CH2. Uh, and what we've actually got here is we have the alkene. So just to rub this out and we'll just I'll show you what the product would look like. So we would have again our CH3 CH because we've now if I'll do this the other way around to to make it similar to the diagram. That's a double bond there. So you can see we've lost the hydrogen from here. That's missing. We've lost our halogen here. But what we've done is we've created a double bond here. So we still have our four bonds on the carbons and uh, the what single bonds um, between the carbons and the hydrogens. But we now have an alkene. So in this case, we have made propane. Three carbons, double bond there. We don't have to denote which carbon the double bond is on because it doesn't matter. If it was on that one, it would still be the exact same molecule. We can't have propetuene. It's only ever going to be propene. Now, this is a fairly simple example, um, and you could get a more difficult one. And the only way they can make this really more difficult is by adding in more carbons. Um, and we could have an example like this. Okay, so we have a starting molecule again, another halo alkane. I've gone with um, two bromohexane, so six carbons second carbons where our bromines um, added, so two bromohexane, um, and I'm going to draw exactly the same mechanism as before, and I'm going to stick to that initial shape, as I said, of that, and so what I'm going to do, first step, I'm going to have my hydroxide coming in, it's going to attack there, we're going to get that cascade occurring, and we're going to get this. And we can see we've just kept that exact same thing as before. The problem is, this isn't quite the same as the last one because there's nothing to stop this happening to that hydrogen now. So what we might find is that, give it a slightly different colour, that could occur. Um, and in this case, we would obviously get uh, hydroxide coming in and missed off that negative charge there hydroxide coming in, again curly arrow, again cascade, and again across here. So there's nothing to stop us producing either, in this first example here, hex 2 in ultimately, or in our second example here, hex 1 in. And there's no reason why we would get one rather than the other. And that's just a point to be really, really aware of there. We could get either. 
Okay, so it's your go now. Um, I'm going to say have a go at drawing the mechanism and working out the products. And I tell you, there are three products for this reaction. And I want three organic. And that's the reaction of two bromo butane with um, we'll just say the hydroxide ion for ease there. So the reaction of two bromo butane with the hydroxide ion. I want the three organic products drawn out with their names. Okay, so starting point what we can find is that we could have the reaction occurring here or we could have the reaction occurring here and in either case we would have that cascade again or from the other side same arrow there but that going over there so you would say well there's two products here there's the alkene or the double bond forming here and the double bond forming here if it forms in this first one here so it's first, we'll call it second here. First, we're going to produce butene. And in the second situation, we're going to produce butene. The trick here is that, and as I mentioned this right at the start, really, the butene, we can have isomerism occurring. So I'll draw the butene again in this way now. You can see that we can have this. EZ isomerism present. So this is our butene. This would be our Z form. And if we were to switch this round, we would get the E form. So that's where our three products come in. We've got butene, we've got Z butene, and we've also got E butene. So three very distinct products there. Okay, that video is really it for elimination. I hope that's been of some help.